So um, today, uh, I want to um, wrap up on uh, Russell's idea that names are more basic than descriptions, that the Frege style idea that you explain names in terms of descriptions can't be right, because um, uh, descriptions are complex, how many phrases, whereas names are simple. And then I'll just review what came up in discussion last time, what Russell says about the Golden Mountain, and then just glance briefly at Russell's own positive take on the problems that were concerning Frege about informativeness and uh, how names prefer. Then, um, with that, today we wrap up on, how should I say, the classical background, and uh, next uh, Monday we start in on Kripke and basically the modern world. Um, Kripke's views are far and away the most influential views of any single philosopher now, and um, uh, we'll be looking at the, the basic ideas that I think most people now think are probably correct on, on how to address any of these questions on Monday. But let's start out with this thing about names being more basic than descriptions. So, the idea here is, um, in Frege and Sell, the picture was, you, the way a name refers is, you hook the name up to a description, um, and the description picks out an object, and that's how the name picks out an object. And Russell's point is, there's got to be, even if that is how it works for some names, even if that is how it works for Aristotle or Scott, it can't be right for names in general. There has to be a basic class of names that gets hooked up to objects, but not by being defined in terms of descriptions, because they're more basic than descriptions. Russell's idea is you could have a language that had um, names but no descriptions in it, but you could not have a language that had descriptions but no names in it. That makes no sense. Names are more fundamental than descriptions. So one way to get at, there are different ways you could do this, um, uh, but here's one way to get at um, uh, what Russell's idea here is. So I want to talk about, this is a notion that's not in Russell, um, a notion I just made up basically called uh, witnessing. Witnessing. Now, you can't tell just from the word what I mean by that, right? So let me explain. Um, suppose you have a remark like someone is F. So what have you got here? Is there a singular term? Is there a general term? Sorry? Is there a general term? Is there a singular term? No, very good, okay. <laughs> right, there's only the general, the, the how many term, someone, right? Now, the thing is, if, um, if you ask me, uh, are there any um, basketball players in the room? I can say, well, someone here's a basketball player. I know that, someone here's a basketball player. There's always a further question you can ask, namely, and who is that? Who is it that is that basketball player? Okay? So it can't just stop there, but I say, someone is F, and you say, and who is it? But I say, it, the road stops there. There's no such thing as going further and naming this person. I mean, it might be that there is someone in the class who has the misfortune not to have been given a name yet. Right, that could happen, but um, we, could, we could always give them a name. It couldn't be that it's true that someone is F, but if you ask, and who is that, there is no answer. Okay, so that where there is a general, I mean, a how many statements someone is F, there is always going to be an answer to the question, namely. And then you put in the name, and you say, A is F. Are we comfortable with that? And I call that witnessing. When you have a general statement, there is something that is F, and then you go further and name it. I call that witnessing the how many statements. Um, witnessing in something like the sense of um, bearing out the truth of. Okay. So if you've got how many statements, there must be name statements to witness them. You couldn't have the how many statements without name statements. Suppose I say there's exactly one X that is F, and any Y that is F is also G. We've all said that from time to time, right? right? There's exactly one person in the room who's a basketball player, and any basketball player is tall then it's got to be possible to go further. Must it be possible? Let me put it to you. Must it be possible to witness this statement? <laughs> what is it to witness this statement? Right, by using a name. Right? Use a name to say, which x is it that is the exactly one x that's f, and uh, that uh, uh, if f is also g? You see what I mean? Let me, let, let's recap. Okay, well, everything's going well up to this point, right? Okay, so you see that's a how many statement, and then you can ask for the name of the thing. Is this a how many statement? Yeah, it's exactly one. What could be more how many than that, right? So there's exactly one thing that's F. It must be possible to answer the question, and which thing is it? There is exactly one thing that is F. If I say at least one, there's at least one basketball player in the room, you can ask namely. But if I say there's exactly one basketball player in the room, you can also say, and who is that? You, you can ask for the name. Yep. Oh, you, it has to be possible to identify it, right? I mean, this is what I was talking about last time. If, if, if I'm, that's right. Um, if I'm facing the board and um, uh, someone speaks, I might quill around and say, who made that remark? Yeah, um, but I have no idea who it was. But um, if, if someone told me there is no answer to that question, someone spoke, but there is no name. It's not possible to name the person. <laughs> That's a philosopher. <laughs> that makes no sense. Whatever. You, you see what I mean? Yeah. Um, okay. So if I say there's exactly one X F, it must be possible to give a name to it. Yeah. It must be possible to witness it. Okay. So um, when I've got that exactly one X F, I can answer the question namely. I can witness it. And how will I witness it? I will witness it by using some name. Let us say A. A is uniquely F. Okay. That, that, I mean, that's just logical, right? That's all fine so far. Okay. But now, suppose um, I take this, there's exactly one X is F, and any Y that's F is also G. There is a more colloquial way of saying this. We can say, the F is G. These doesn't mean the same thing. If you're going to say the F, it's only right to say the F if there's exactly one F. If I say the king of America, it's only right to say that if there's exactly one king of America. If there are zero kings, or if there are two kings, then what I say is can't be right. So if I say the F, that means there's exactly one F. Yes? <laughs> Do the, does this mean the same as this? Can you identify any difference in meaning between these two statements? Yep. Which one? Yeah. I'm interpreting, uh, well, using formal logic, I'm saying there's an element X and it's F. 
such that any other element in set F is also in set E. In that case, the mean seems like it's different. Uh, the meaning of would be different, but that, uh, the way you put it requires that there be elements in, in uh, which are f, but uh, are not exactly one f. But that's a contradiction. Right? If there's exactly one f, there can't be anything else as f. So you're saying there's exactly one x in f. Or you're saying that the x is identical to f. <laughs> I say there's exactly, maybe this is English and American, I said I have that one x which is f. Suppose I said one x, that is f. No, I just mean, if I say there's exactly one basketball player in the room, right? and it turns out there are two, then what I said is wrong. Yeah? But when I say the f, it doesn't mean there exists an f. So if you say the king of America, you think that's fine? No, it doesn't exist, right? There's no such thing. Yeah. That's right, but if I say the king of America, am I also implying that there is a king of America? You, do you see what I mean? That's why people don't talk about the king of America. Because <laughs> there's no such thing, right? It makes, us, oh, it makes sense, but it, doesn't, it just doesn't exist. So you don't talk about it, you don't use that phrase. Yeah. So if you're going to talk about the F, there has to be at least something which is F. Yeah. Um, Yep. That's right. Yeah. Well, the, 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 uh, what you put in there is a general term, in the sense which is tall is a general term. And um, to make it colloquial, you sometimes have to bash things around a bit. Yeah. So if you want to say, um, if you want to put tall in for the F slot there, yeah, what you have to say is the tall one, or something like that. The tall one is F. Sorry, the tall one is G. You, you see what I mean? Yeah. So you can, get, you can always get the effect. But sometimes to make it colloquial, um, you have to bash it around a bit. But, but yeah, F and G are always general terms. Yeah. Uh, that's right, if there's exactly one and something else is f, then that would be more than one. Uh, do, you, do you see what I mean? I thought that there's exactly one x, uh, but other things could be f. Ah, very good. Uh, uh, no, um, <laughs> when I say there's exactly one x, I mean, um, consider the entire universe, the whole world, right? Absolutely everything. Or rather, absolutely everything we're talking about at this moment. You see what I mean? So we're just talking about the people in this room, um, and that's the whole world, so far as the present conversation goes. So x and y aren't way to break it. Uh, they're, they're both only talking about things in the room, or things in whatever domain you're talking about. Do you see what I mean? Um, <laughs> no, I don't mean there's one x. I mean, there's only one thing that is f. I, okay, look, um, <laughs> I, could get, I could get the same effect by saying there's exactly one thing which is f in any way. It's also g. Okay? Yeah? Okay, thank you. We like to make sense. Um, okay. okay, so this is how these two mean the same thing? You're comfortable with that? Okay, and this is a how many statement? Yeah? Therefore, this is a how many statement? Okay, um, and this statement demands witnessing. A how many statement can be witnessed? You can always ask him, what is the name of that thing? Yes? So this is a how many statement. The F is G. So when you say the F is G, you can always say, and who is that? This F of which you tell me. What is his name? You haven't given a name just by giving the how many statement. So there have to be um, names uh, uh, underpinning the use of the definite descriptions. There has got to be an array of names that are more basic than the descriptions, that can witness the truth of your statements involving descriptions. So you can say I witness that by giving it a name, A is F. Okay? That's to say, there's got to be a basic class of names that are going to get tied up to objects, but not by being defined in terms of descriptions. This is a very basic kind of logical point, but you see that if it's right, it just blows up Frege and Sell. It blows up the natural way of thinking about these problems. Yeah. So, can't somebody just respond to that by saying that when you have a definite description, you ask for a name, and then you give a name. What you're doing is you're giving a name that stands for that description, and you have to put a name. It, it doesn't stand for the description. It stands for the object that is denoted by the description. I know that's what you're saying, but I'm saying. <laughs> I'm <laughs> I'm saying I'm just, I mean, it seems kind of arbitrary which way you go. It seems like you could just as easily describe it in a way that I'm Okay. Let me try putting this another way. Um, Suppose you take uh, any language is going to have singular terms and general terms. And suppose you ask, how are the general terms of a language explained? Okay, how do you, so suppose you put general terms like is tall, plays basketball, smokes, fishes, right? Um, so, so you've got these general terms. Now, suppose I don't know the meaning of these words. Right? Everyone in the class was at one point at that stage, right? There was a time in your life when you didn't know the meaning of any general terms. So how do you have the meanings of the general terms explained to you? Suppose I don't know the meaning of is tall. Right? I'm um, alert, intelligent, I can see very well, um, but I just don't know what is tall means. And you're not going to explain that to me, right? Now, could you do it? Could you explain the meaning of this tall to me by using general terms? Sorry, by using how many terms? What I mean is, suppose you take, uh, so I say, what does tall mean? I hear people talking about tallness, but I never get what it is. And you look around the room and you say, well, someone is tall. <laughs> say, well, <laughs> thank you. Um, or you say, many people here are tall, though some are not. I still don't get it. Right? What I'm going to have to do to get an understanding of the general term is to have you say to me, well, look over here. Bill is tall and Sally is tall and Jemima is tall, but... Um, Charlotte is not tall. Right? If you give me names for all the tall ones and names for the ones that are not tall, then I can get it. Then I have a chance of getting what you're talking about. If you confine yourself to using general terms, like what is death? I should know what death. Remember that time when you didn't know what death. Maybe you guys still don't know what death is. But, um, but there was a time when you really didn't know what death was, right? And you just told, well, you know, everyone dies. That doesn't tell you what it means. Right? You need some examples. I, I, I won't go too. <laughs> I won't get too deep into this. 
Um, you need some cases, right? You need cases in order to understand the general terms. The only way you get cases is by getting a name. That's another way of coming at the point that you only understand what the general term. Sorry, I keep saying general term. I mean how many, but I hope you can follow me. Um, the only way you can understand what the how many term means is um, I explain to you what is tall means in the context of all these names like um, Jemima or Harry or whatever, and uh, uh, then you say, now what does it mean to say someone is tall? Well, what it means to say someone is tall is um, I can find you a name that if you put it into the is tall slot will give you a true sentence. So when you're explaining the meanings of the signs of a language, you have to explain the general terms in conjunction, in, in the context of their use with proper names, I mean real names. Um, and then these how many terms come later, they come next. If you didn't have any names in your language, you wouldn't be able to understand the general terms. There's no such thing as having the general terms explained to you. Uh, okay, we're building up. One, two, three, four. Yeah. So why can't we just say tall means anyone above six foot three? You give a definition, sure. So there you define a general term. You understand what a general term means without having any proper Very, yeah. You can certainly do that. Um, you, you, you can, it, it is always a, an option to explain one general term in terms of other general terms, right? Okay. So uh, th th that's what you just did, sure. right? Um, but now consider the general terms that you used to explain those first, that first term. Yeah? How are those explained? You can give a definition of them, too. Yeah? Um, but then that definition will itself have to appeal to more general terms. That process has to come to an end somewhere. Yeah? And then at the end of the day, you are going to have to explain the general terms by giving examples. And this is very obvious with color words. If, if you think of terms like red or scarlet or um, yellow, right, then um, it's very hard even to give one definition of them in terms of other general terms. Yeah? The, the color spectrum. Yeah. Oh, you, like you could say oranges is the one in between red and... No, I mean like the wavelength, the actual like scientific wavelength. Oh, sure, you could do that, right? That's, I, I don't know if you've ever met a, a four-year-old who's interested in what the color words mean, but that, that's not how we do it. <laughs> do, do, do you see what I mean? Um, um, that, that's pretty fancy. And the, the, thing is, <laughs> right, the thing is, if you did do that, right, if you did do the physics definition, yeah, um, someone could perfectly well understand the physics definition and be a real quiz at understanding the physics of the situation, and then say, oh, so that's what this shade is. And that could really be news. That could be an informative identity. This thing about the, the, the objects around me that I've often noticed, that is when they're reflecting light of those wavelengths. Isn't that weird? You could have thought it. Do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, so if you have someone who understands the color words quite independently um, of the physics, and then you define some general terms in terms of the physics, it's going to be used to be told the same thing. Yeah. So I think ironically understanding the color words isn't by definition. Yeah. And we know that the process of definition has to stop somewhere. So even if you don't like that example, there have got to be other examples. Yeah. And then you come to those primitive general terms. The only way you're going to explain them is by giving examples. This one's right, this one's right, this one's right, this one isn't. That kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, the opposite of short. Sure, you, you can do that. But then you've got to explain what short means. Do, do you see what I mean? Yeah. Um, I get, <laughs> no, that's fair enough. If you just take the understanding of some general terms for granted, then okay, that, that's fair enough. But really, the only reason you can do that is because you had the use of those general terms in the context of sentences and names in them. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> you don't really like convince them. Yeah, it is. It, for, it, it, why doesn't it? <laughs> That's perfectly fair. Um, uh, Frege is not quite explicit about what a mode of presentation actually is. I mean, that's actually why I introduced it with those photographs and so on, um, because there is this intuitive notion of your way of being presented with the object. That is, it's not obvious that that's the same thing as a description, but what I said about that was, when you get down to brass tacks and you say to Frege, well, what does it mean? What actually are you talking about when you say the mode of presentation associated with the name Aristotle, for example? All he ever gives you is a description. That's all you ever get. So there is an abstract possibility, there is a bare possibility, as you say, of an interpretation of Frege that talks about mode of presentation or something like that, but doesn't talk about descriptions. It says, well, these are just examples Frege gives. But it's just not obvious what that means, what that would be. In the geometry example, it's not like that description of what that's actually why I put the geometry example up in colors the way I did. That, um, that geometry example, what he does is, you mean the one, the point of intersection of A and B is the same as the point of intersection of B and C. See, if you just take it literally at the face value, he's giving you two descriptions there, the point of intersection of A and B and the point of intersection of B and C. But it's very tempting to um, uh, say, no, draw the diagram, and then he's talking about two visual ways of being given the thing, rather than descriptions. He's just trying to indicate these visual ways of being given the thing, and that's di they're different. Um, but okay, that's a perfectly fair point. Um, um, all I say is it's a challenge to say what that means, a mode of presentation is not descriptive. Um, there's one other thing. So, um, back to the last question, we said exactly one thing, which is anything that is after double. Why do you need the first clause to check the logic equivalent after double? If you just have anything that is after double G, isn't that, isn't that logic equivalent to the after G? Uh, I think that means just the same as what I